Well, I want to speak at this session on the long war against God, which, as perhaps you know, is the title of my most recent book. It's published in December, and the second printing already out in February. It seems like the Lord is going to use that one in a unique way, too, and it's been getting some very good response. It was selected by the Evangelical Book Club as its December book of the month, I think, and at least a couple of three other book clubs have used it, so it looks like the Lord is using it, and I hope you'll get it and read it. It's the most thorough and best documented, I think, book dealing with the history and the influence of evolutionism over the ages and over the world that's uh, available. So uh, I want to just sort of outline that this morning. It's far too big a subject to cover in 45 minutes, but just to give you an idea of the uh, of the scope and the impact of the creation-evolution conflict. You can perhaps guess from the title, The Long War Against God, that the theme of my talk, as well as of the book, is that there is a cosmic warfare going on. We're all involved in it, one way or the other, between God and the devil. It has been going on since the beginning. Every age, every nation has been involved, and we're involved on one side or the other, because after all, these are the only two worldviews. They incorporate everything, and either we can explain the origin and development of all things in terms of continuing natural processes, or we can't, one or the other. And so the one is evolution, one is creation. They embrace everything in the uh, world of, of sense and of knowledge and of understanding, and one must believe one or the other. You can't really believe both because uh, they're not synonyms, they're antonyms. Each is the opposite of the other. And there is a great cosmic conflict going on, and the basic uh, rationale and the foundation of that conflict is between these two great worldviews, God-centered or creature-centered, creator or, create, or, or creature, or creation versus evolution. And so this has been going on since the beginning in one way or another, and my thesis is that uh, the creationist worldview, or you might say the creationist tree, has borne good fruits, the evolutionist tree has bo borne bad fruits. We can evaluate these two worldviews scientifically, and we do that, and we would say that all of the scientific evidence supports creation. Not a single real fact of science supports evolution. All the real evidence supports creation. But there's also another way that you can approach this conflict that the Lord Jesus himself gave us. He said, By their fruits you shall know them. A good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. And so we can evaluate these two worldviews in terms not only of their scientific validity or invalidity, but also in terms of the fruits which they have produced, and I would maintain that the creationist tree has produced good fruits, it produced sound doctrine, it's produced good systems, it's produced uh, good practices. The evolutionist tree, on the other hand, universally has produced bad doctrine, bad fruits, bad practices. That may sound kind of an extreme statement, but I believe it can be documented compellingly and most people don't know this. Even most Christian people are not aware of it. So that's why we want to emphasize it in the book and in this particular session. Now, in support of the idea that there is this basic conflict of evolution versus creation, the devil versus God, let me just remind you of a few verses of Scripture. For those who think that this is kind of an extreme position, the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, said himself in the 8th chapter of John, that the devil is the father of liars. He is a liar. He is the father of it. He is the great deceiver. It says in the 12th chapter of Revelation, he is the one who has deceived the whole world. It says in uh, Revelation, or, or rather in the first Corinthians, second Corinthians chapter 4, if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them who are lost, and whom the God of this age, that is the devil, has blinded the minds of them who don't believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. If people cannot see the gospel, it's because their minds have been blinded by the devil. He's the great deceiver. He appears sometimes as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness, but he is basically a deceiver. And 1 John 5:19 says, The whole world lies in the wicked one. And if it is true that uh, evolution is the great lie, as Ken Ham's book uh, suggests in his title, and I think is certainly valid and can be demonstrated and documented, then, of course, the fundamental author of that lie must be Satan. Now, I want to just sort of establish generally what I said, that the fruit of the evolutionary tree is bad in terms of its whole scope, and the fruit of the creationist tree is good. In terms of, the, of creation, the good tree, 
Let me just suggest a few things. The, 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 are you aware of the fact that our nation was founded upon creationism? Our American nation, with all of its tradition of religious liberty and freedom and so forth. Uh, it's in the Declaration of Independence. We've been endow endowed with, by our Creator with certain unalienable rights and so on. And it's implicit in the Constitution, in the writings of the Founding Fathers, uh, even men like Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin, who were probably not fundamental Bible-believing Christians, but they were they were deists maybe, but at least they did believe in creation. Thomas Jefferson explicitly rejected the idea of evolution in his writings, which was known long before Darwin, of course. And uh, Ben Franklin also said that he believed in a creator who created the world, so did George Washington. Even Tom Paine did. So the founding fathers of our nation were creationists, and it was founded on creationist principles, Based on uh, built around laws which were the laws of that creator. Uh, our initial schools taught creation, not only the church schools, but even the public schools when they first came into existence. But it wasn't long before the Unitarians like Horace Mann and others got control of the public school system, and not uh, too long before John Dewey came along and established evolutionary humanism as the religion of our public school system, established the American Humanist Association with its humanist tenets and so forth, and since that time our nation, its schools, its courts, its media, just about our whole society has been uh, taken over by the evolutionary worldview. But the creationist worldview was our foundation, and the same thing is true with science. True science doesn't support evolution. The founding fathers of science were creationists. Many people think that science came out of the Renaissance, but it didn't do that. Greek philosophy was restored in the Renaissance, and that was evolutionist. But uh, Science, true science, came out of the Reformation when people began to have access to the Bible and read and promulgate the Word of God. And then came along men like Johann Kepler and Isaac Newton and uh, Robert Boyle, the father of chemistry, and uh, Pascal and Pasteur and uh, Brewster and all of the great founding fathers of science. Almost without exception, there might have been a few exceptions, but by and large, the founding fathers of science were Bible-believing creationists. At least they professed to believe in in uh, creation uh, and, in, and in Christianity. They, again, might have been some of them somewhat unorthodox in various ways, but they all believed in God as the Creator. They believed in the Bible. They believed in Christ. And they said, like Isaac Newton and Kepler and men like Clark Maxwell, that they were simply thinking God's thoughts after him as they were doing their science. But now science also has been taken over by the evolutionary worldview, by and large. And now we have the idea of being circulated by our scientific establishment, including our California educational establishment, that science is a proved fact and everything has to be taught in the light of evolutionism. Well, uh, true science, true Americanism, true Christianity were based on the foundation of creation. Ken Ham has been bringing out the, the latter concept, but let me just mention a couple of other points along that line. Sometimes we do hear people say, well, don't get involved in preaching creation, just preach the gospel important to get people saved, not to make creations out of them. Well, in a sense, we would agree with that, and our purpose is to see people come to the Lord Jesus Christ, but you have to realize that Jesus Christ was Creator before He became the Savior. And the reason we need a Savior is because we have rebelled against our Creator. Who is Jesus Christ? You know that Christ, you're sure you know that He is the Creator. By Him were all things created in heaven and in earth, whether visible or invisible, thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him. As in Colossians 1.16. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Speaking again of Christ. He is our Creator, and you don't really preach Christ without preaching Him as He is. We don't want to preach another Jesus who is not the true Jesus, as we see mentioned in Corinthians. We want to preach Christ as He is, and He was the Creator, and the Savior, and the coming King and Lord. And that's the full scope of the doctrine of Christology which is founded then upon Christ as Creator. And the Gospel, do you know that the last time and the climactic time the word Gospel is used in the Bible is in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation, verse 6 and 7, where John says, I saw another angel flying through the midst of heaven, having the everlasting Gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, saying, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. The last time the word gospel is used in the Bible, there's 101 times it's used, that's the last of them, and there it says that an angel is flying back and forth across the sky calling out with a loud voice to everybody on the earth the everlasting gospel. Remember Paul in the first chapter of the book of Galatians said, if an angel from heaven comes preaching some other gospel than what I preached unto you, let him be accursed. 
So we can be sure that this angel was preaching the same gospel that Paul was, and the essence of his gospel was to worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. In other words, worshiping a Jesus who comes into one's experience by some personal feeling or something like that isn't the way it is. We have to recognize that Jesus Christ is the creator of the heavens and the earth and all things therein. And that we have rebelled against him, and he's pronounced a curse on the creation because of sin, and death has come in because of that. And therefore we need a Savior, and the great creator is the only one who can be the Savior. Now, there are a few creationist religions besides Christianity, Islam and Judaism, for example. That's about the end of it. And they are creationists because they believe in the book of Genesis as their foundational account of creation. But they miss the boat when they refuse to acknowledge that the Creator must be the Savior and that He must die and rise again in order to implement His purpose in creation. And so only biblical, trinitarian Christianity really is the, is the only real creationist religion and it's basic that we believe then in creation. We could go on and show that all the other basic doctrines of Christianity are founded upon the doctrine of creation. A man wrote me just this week and says, well, you shouldn't be talking about creation being the foundation because don't you know that Christ is the head of the church? Yes, Christ is the head of the church. Christ the creator is the head of the church. And furthermore, he's the head of the whole creation, not just the church. He's, he's the author, the finisher, he's the head, he's the alpha and the omega of everything. And we need to see him as he really is. Now, uh, let me just stress that on the other end, other hand, the other worldview of evolutionism, which tries to explain everything in terms of, a, of an eternal cosmos, which never was created, never had a creator, the cosmos itself, therefore, being the ultimate reality, that's basically what evolution is. We explain everything in terms of the cosmos and its processes and systems and properties, which may be personified in terms of different gods and goddesses, perhaps, but basically it's identifying ultimate reality with this physical universe. And that evolutionary worldview has come to dominate not only our modern world, but has dominated the world since time began. And that's what I want you to see in the few minutes that we have. First, as far as the present order of things is concerned, let me just read a statement from Sir Julian Huxley. If you don't know who that is, he died a number of years ago, so you younger people may not remember, but uh, Huxley was probably the world's top evolutionist of the 20th century until he died. He was the first director general of UNESCO. He was the main founder of neo-Darwinism, wrote many, many books. He was a profoundly influential man, one of the founders of the American Humanist Association also, along with John Dewey. And in one of his books he says this, the concept of evolution was soon extended into other than biological fields. Inorganic subjects such as the life history of stars and the formation of the chemical elements on the one hand, and on the other hand subjects like linguistics, social anthropology, and comparative law and religion are studied now from an evolutionary angle till today we're able to see evolution as a universal, all-pervading process. In other places, he says, the whole of reality is evolution, a single process of self-transformation. So every subject, not just biology and the natural sciences, but the social sciences, the fine arts, everything today is taught within the framework of, a, of an evolutionary premise in our colleges, universities, public schools, and unfortunately even in many Christian schools. Evolution is the basic premise in every discipline. So it is a worldview which impacts every field, no matter what your field of study may be. Evolution is at the bottom of it today. Well, the American Humanist Association I've mentioned, that's what's really taught in our public schools today. And state universities, they, they wouldn't acknowledge that this is a religion. Some of them do. But basically, this evolutionary humanism is a religious point of view. And the tenets of the American Humanist Association, which were promulgated by John Dewey primarily and Julian Huxley and others of like mind back in 1933 first when they formed the association, really pro uh, provide basically what we find being taught in our schools today and in the news media today. So whether it's explicit or not, basically these tenets of humanism have become the official doctrine of our intellectual world today. The American Humanist Association was formed in 1933, and then they had another, in addition to the original tenets of humanism, there was another set of tenets or another manifesto that was given in 1973, and the two were combined and published again and more recently by the American Humanist Association in their magazine, The Humanist. And in the preface to that, Paul Kurtz, said this, humanism is a philosophical, religious, and moral point of view as old as human civilization itself. This is nothing new. It has its roots in classical China, Greece, and Rome. It's expressed in the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, in the Scientific Revolution, and in the 20th century. And what is this humanism? 